Great. Well, let's uh, let's start things off, if that's all right. Uh, my name is James Tager. I have the privilege of being the moderator of this event, and I am a research director at PEN America. Uh, I'm going to briefly introduce it, and then uh, Jim Grossman from uh, American Historical Association will will also uh, provide a few remarks, and then we'll get quickly to uh, the event itself. Uh, I just want to say who PEN America is, if you'll indulge me. We're uh, an, inter uh, an organization that stands at the intersection of literature and human rights to protect free expression in the United States and worldwide. And within the larger organization, the PEN Across America program provides resources to mobilize PEN America communities around the country. We currently have new chapters in Birmingham, Piedmont, Miami, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, uh, and Tulsa, which is, I know, where a lot of um, attendees will be joining from. Uh, and obviously, this is really a, 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 um, a conversation that has some of its roots in, in, in Tulsa and the Tulsa community. Our PEN America chapters are doing fantastic work, including organizing public forums, highlighting the work of local journalists during COVID-19, and hosting literary conversations and workshops, kind of like this one. To learn more about what you're doing, please visit pen.org. And the best way to support this work is to become a member of PEN America. Our strength is in our membership, a nationwide, a nationwide community of novelists, nonfiction authors, journalists, editors, poets, screenwriters, essayists, and playwrights. Um, to join, please go to www.pen, like the writing implement.org slash join today. We need your voices and, and support now more than ever. And working together, we can defend some of our precious freedoms, which leads unfortunately very easily into this conversation today. But first I wanna turn it over to Jim Grossman briefly. Uh, Jim, take it away. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege for the American Historical Association uh, to collaborate with PEN America on this. Uh, both of us are very concerned about current threats to history education in Oklahoma and elsewhere in the United States. The legislation that uh, Oklahoma is dealing with. Uh, it, Oklahoma is really one of just 27 states, and this legislation looks pretty much the same everywhere. Uh, let me just give you a quick sense, uh, partly in response to James, what the American Historical Association is. Uh, we are the largest organization of professional historians in the world. Uh, we provide leadership for the discipline of history. We promote the critical role of historical thinking in public life. Uh, and we try to defend academic freedom. We develop and maintain professional standards for teaching and research in history. And we support innovative scholarship and teaching. And our work here is really about this issue of supporting and promoting uh, history education, uh, quality history education. Uh, it is in the interest of the American Historical Association and the people of Oklahoma. Uh, that high school, elementary school, and college students in Oklahoma be educated properly and get good history. Uh, the EHA recently did a survey. Uh, we work with a professional research uh, organization. And it turns out that three quarters of all Americans think that we should teach uh, in schools and in public history venues, even the most uncomfortable aspects of our past. Uh, so this kind of legislation actually is contrary to what most people believe. Uh, it's contrary to what historians believe, because what historians, and this is historians across a broad spectrum of interpretation, believe that we cannot heal divisions in our society until we understand their roots and their evolution. Uh, anybody who has ever dealt with their own body knows that you cannot heal a disease that you don't understand. And we have two panelists who are knowledgeable about history education in Oklahoma. And I'm just going to turn it over to them to talk about why this matters in Oklahoma and what you can do about it. But I am going to ask one more thing, which is I encourage everybody who is listening to this, watching this, to please think about running for your local school board. Uh, that is where decisions are made, and we want people who care and who are knowledgeable uh, and want teachers who are professionals and to let them do their work. Thanks so much, Jim. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a 
pleasure to uh, collaborate and co-sponsor on this event with you, as well as with Mag Magic City Books in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Support your local independent bookstore. Uh, they're a vital part of the literary firmament. Um, well, I, as Jim intimated, we are seeing a wave of legislation in state houses across the country that have the potential to deeply impact the way we teach history, literature, civics, and on other um, humanities subjects at, at possibly a fundamental level. And we're seeing this across the country. It's something that is actively occurring. Uh, and it is something that um, Oklahoma is one of the places where it's occurring. Uh, what I'm talking about is House Bill 1775, which was passed into law this year. And uh, with me today, we have two people who are really placed to authoritatively speak on this subject. First is Carlicia Williams Bradley, uh, a youth advocate and uh, with a long and distinguished history as a, a change maker and an educator. Uh, the founder of Women Empowering Nations, uh, and perhaps most um, relevantly for our conversation, an Oklahoma Board of Education member, someone who's really been um, at the exact confluence uh, of how this bill, how this law has played out and is continuing to play out in Oklahoma. And we also have Anne Hyde, who is a history professor at University of Oklahoma, and her books on American history have received multiple awards but she can also speak as a voice of professional authority regarding how this bill can affect the teaching of history as, as, as a professional historian teacher. So I, I wanna go to them now. I wanna start with kind of a 101 question and I, I'll turn to Anne first if that's all right, which is the 101 of, can you tell us a bit about House Bill 1775, what it is, what it does and, and where we stand in relation to it today? You're muted. Always muted when I start. Okay, <laughs> here, I'm, here we go. So, so last spring in Oklahoma, there's this little breath of air. Um, we had just had the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. There's a moment when high school teachers, middle school teachers, university teachers are beginning to think about a much fuller story of the Oklahoma past. So there's this, there's this moment that you know, it's kind of exciting. We're gonna open up and make this, you know, something that students really know about and make the history more complicated. And as we're, you know, thinking about lesson plans, how we'll work this into the survey, then this house bill appears. And as, as Jim said, it's part of, you know, a bunch of other states. But I think the concern is about two issues is in, in terms of the way the bill is actually worded. So there's a lot of language about no one can be made to feel uncomfortable by virtue of his race or sex, that there's anything inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive um, in terms of how they operate in the world. Um, then, then further, and this is like, no individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of his or her race or sex. So you're not supposed to make people feel bad. And I think that that comes ar you know, around these you know, race and sex and other kinds of discrimination. And then the other piece of the bill specifically is any orientation or requirement that presents any form of race or sex stereotyping or a bias on the basis of race or sex shall be prohibited. So on the heels of the anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, the University of Oklahoma, as a way to meet the promise of, you know, six or seven years of really bad racial events, had finally spun up a new course that was called Gateway to Understanding that was going to be all about these issues for OU freshmen. So there was some concern there. And I'm the coordinator for the OU history survey class, which every single student at OU has to take. And so it's required. So we were concerned that we fell under this legislation and you know, how would, would that impact our teaching? What would we tell our teaching assistants? What would students know about it? So it just put all this uncertainty in this really hopeful moment. So 
that, that unfortunately sounds right. Uh, there was a, really a saga as this developed, um, which was that Governor Stitt signed this into law in May, and then it went to uh, the State Board of Education to implement regulations that would essentially kind of develop how the law would actually be implemented. Carlisha, you were the lone no vote on the first vote of the regulations for this. Um, can you tell us a bit about the process? Uh, what was, you know, how it went from uh, law to how it was going to become regulations and tell us a bit about your no vote and what was going through your mind as you voted. Sure, so Anne, I appreciate you setting the stage and explaining a bit about the bill. Um, like much of this legislation across the country, it happened quite swiftly um, and oftentimes in the dark. Like there was a bill that was gutted to create this bill. So we have to lay that context first, which also sets the stage for the emergency rules that were in turn implemented. The State Board of Education gets education rules that we are education legislation that we create rules for every single year. Uh, that process usually does not take place until January of the next year of the dozens of bills that were passed in this legislative session. This was the one bill that was constituted as an emergency that needed to go before the board for a vote in July. And I was very concerned about this just in the first place because when emergency rules are passed, there is not the extended um, public comment phase where the public is able to view these rules, comment on them, especially thinking about educators who are directly impacted by not only the legislation, but especially the rules that were put in place. Um, and there was again, an organized effort to see to it that these rules were voted on in July and implemented. Several um, things based in the fear of race and racism, uh, the emails that I was constantly inundated with, letters, phone calls, uh, a lot of fear in behind these conversations taking place within schools and placing it under the guise of critical race theory. When actually, when we unpack that conversation and unpack these rules in this legislation, it's truly speaking to uh, fragility, uh, white fragility to be precise. And when we create rules that are punishing and essentially in some cases getting to the point where you could take away a teacher's certification and we're basing it on feelings, it's a question of how is that measured? Uh, so when I voted no, knowing I would be the, the lone no vote, uh, it was very clear for me that I didn't agree with the legislation and I would have voted no if I was in that seat uh, and could not in the right conscious approve these rules, knowing the consequences that were tied to them, knowing the vague nature of them and what that would continue to do is to perpetuate fear, silence teachers and leave the truth of our hard history out of classrooms. One of the things that stood out to me when I reviewed the law was, you know, the fact that the last section of it says we are passing this under this sort of state of emergency. And it really stood out to me that during a time in which coronavirus is continuing, right, that this would be what constitutes the type of law that would be passed under a state of emergency. Um, and let me turn to you to see, firstly, if you have any reflections on what was just said, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll continue to ask questions. Well, and I, I think it is, I'm, I'm glad that Carlicia pointed out that sort of white fragility piece, because I think that's a huge piece of it. So in a way, and my colleagues in Texas have been reminding me of this, um, you could say that this is the result, it's a backlash and it's the result of 40 years of an effort to teach a fuller, more accurate history. Um, so, and there's a furious backlash. So maybe that's in a weird way, good news that, you know, this is, this is the last phase of this, um, this angry denial of facts about the past and present, um, maybe is good news, but it's stressful if you're in the classroom and there are those, you know, regulations hanging out there. You know, what, what happens if, you know, students react to these difficult moments in the past, which that's our job actually. Carlisha, you, you use the phrase under the guise of critical race theory, and I thought that was such a, an, a, a 
clever and concise way to, to describe it, right? Can we drill down on that a bit? I mean, critical race theory is a term that I would presume the average American had not heard of even you know a little over a year ago and came on to this sort of national media scene very quickly, hand in hand with these bills, right? I mean, these bills, there's very much a relationship between the, the this conversation that has spurred up about critical race theory and these bills which have been proposed in, in state courthouses, uh, state houses across the country. Uh, what's going on there and, and, and how does it sort of relate to your points about how it fits into these broader discussions and narratives and tensions around the way we teach history? Well, I think that when people are sharing, you know, critical race theory, this does, doesn't belong in K-12 education. I did not become familiar with critical race theory actually until I was at the University of Oklahoma. We, it is rare that you see critical race theory discussed in K-12 education. It started in legal studies looking at the systematic impact of racism in our inequities and in systems. So stating that racism goes beyond individual acts and the ways in which our society has been built, especially here in America, the institutions and the structures and the ways in which they operate, we can see the impact of racism all around us. And I think that if we really drill down to what we're talking about and when parents reach out and when we heard public comments at the board meeting, they were talking about not talking about race at all in the classroom, not speaking about the history and stating that um, we, we heard some very far reaching comments that conversation about race and racism in the classroom would lead to genocides. Like the, these are some deep rooted um, false narratives about what critical race theory is and isn't and really steers folks away and puts under that umbrella of critical race theory simply the conversations about the truth of what has transpired within our history and allowing for students to think critically and make connections to that, to their lived reality. So uh, will concepts that might be closely aligned to critical race theory come up when students begin to understand their history, unpack their lived experiences, think about the neighborhoods in which they live in and the redlining and the Jim Crow laws and go all the way back? I mean, that that's the type of learner we want to uh, produce to in turn advance our society and build a more equitable and just world. And so I really see this as a huge threat it's a threat to the high quality education that we say that we're promising students. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely. I mean, the, the core of the US history course is, you know, we there's some facts from the past that are very uncomfortable. We talk about white supremacy, slavery, stealing indigenous land and children. Um, and also, and, and this gets at the sort of theory part of it, how that came to seem normal. So, you know, how do you metabolize that as the way the world is supposed to be? And it's uncomfortable to have that certainty pricked open. Um, but, you know, things like, so, you know, if you, just, you assigned Toni Morrison's Beloved or Diane Glancy's Pushing the Bear, if, if, you know, students cry over reading that, is that, are we gonna go to jail because they've had that human emotion around you know a mother's decision which they might feel bad about yeah and and to add on to that Anne, i mean that's been part of the fears that i've heard from teachers and professionals who are like this is the straw for me i mean oklahoma has had its challenges in public education but this is far reaching and and for our experienced educators who love the work that they do this is a threat to their ability to provide instruction and they're wondering with this legislation, what does it mean for even a student to begin to have a conversation about a topic? Does that put my job at, in jeopardy? And I also forgot to mention um, when we started talking about the board meeting and how this came about with the rules, I'll add that the Oklahoma State Department of Education had not received one complaint about critical race theory being taught in schools. And there was someone who said this, and it's often been said that this legislation was a solution in search of a problem. It is not something that we heard much about 
until this bill was introduced, until these rules were, were proposed, we saw parents coming out of the woodwork to present at public comments about some of our largest school districts across the state that serve the most diverse student populations. Let me circle back. I wanna highlight something that's emerging because I think something really important to underline is the examples that are already coming up of specific concepts or themes or facts or curricula decisions that could be affected by this, right? I mean, uh, given specific examples of books where it's like, can we teach these books? Can we teach about these moments in history, these phenomena in history? And, and Carlisha, you were just saying, you've been hearing that feedback from people. Um, and that's, that stands out to me. And it makes me think of something in my own work as an anti-censorship advocate, which is that the kind of more vague and broad and blurry the line is that a, that a legislation draws, the more that people will self-censor because they don't know where the line is very clearly, right? Um, and, and could we sort of bring it back to that point, which is, um, you know, a lot of these sort of prohibited ideas Right, I mean, these are laws that literally sort of prohibit ideas and arguments and and thought and sort of trains of thought. Um, that a lot of these are so vaguely worded or very broadly worded that it is very unclear how they could apply to you know where to draw the line, and it seems awfully sort of arbitrary or up to the discretion of enforcement officials to decide what speech, what curricular decisions. Um, are permissible and what are not. And um, as I said, I know you've both hit those points already, but if there's anything more you have to say about the vagueness of this and, and what this means when it comes to educators, you know, looking at their curricula, looking at how they're gonna teach their courses and making specific decisions about what they're going to include and what they're going to exclude. Well, I mean, one of the things that's distinctive about the course that I'm involved with is it's mostly, you know, faculty who are, you know, giving the big lectures, but we have a whole bunch of graduate students, 40 of them for 3,600 students, um, who are, they have, they have no power. So, you know, they're in a situation where they're working really closely with kids talking about controversial documents, issues, um, and they're, you know, one student texting someone, something to someone, um, you know, their entire careers could be ruined in a little social media riff around this. So, and partly because it's so vague. So you don't know where the attack might come from. I agree. The, the vague nature of the legislation, even when you hear folks talk about it, um, and, and even the legislatures who, the members of the legislature who passed it speak about it, it's, it's very broad. I think that you hit it right on the head, James, when you said if it's so vague, people begin to censor themselves because they don't know what is crossing the line. We don't know if a student brings up a conversation in the classroom that makes another student feel uncomfortable. They're in in my class, a parent reports it. It depends on that district's process. Some of the reporting can go straight to the State Department of Education, but parents also have the right to report it straight to their district. Who knows what that looks like? And when we're thinking about teachers who are barely hanging on in the middle of a pandemic in K-12 education, this is one more thing to worry about. And it's a huge fear, especially, you know, Anne had mentioned, we just had the centennial of the Tulsa race massacre. We just had a huge push about sharing this information and putting it back into classrooms. And there's a question that, that the truth of our history here in Tulsa will make you uncomfortable. You can trace that history from 1921 all the way back to 2021 for the lived experiences, especially of Black people living in this city. Are those conversations off limits in the classroom? The State Department says teach the standards, but what happens when those standards are uncomfortable based on this legislation? Because all that stuff has been added to those standards. So exactly. that, you know, that's, that's tricky. Um, what, one of the things that, and, and this, is, this is where, you know, this is one of these, I, you know, there's a lot of I got you 
that that looks like it smells like critical race theory mm -hmm. to me. But you know, slowing down a little bit and thinking about how powerful it is for students of all races to understand how racism works. It's it's not the fault of uneducated, ignorant racists. It's not individuals. So beginning to understand that there's a system out there that they can see, that they can name, and that they can fight against, they're all relieved that they, they there's a way that they can talk about that. Um, and, and the advantage, of course, of you know doing it in history is this stuff happened in the past, so it didn't happen to your cousin yesterday. So you can practice all those skills in talking about those hard things, but not if you're scared you're going to be sent to jail for doing it. Right. And well, sorry, James, I've jumped going back and forth with Anne. <laughs> but I, you know, piggybacking off of that, Anne, it just makes me think about what students are actually hungry for. When that state board meeting occurred, only one student came and, and spoke. It was a Black female student from Millwood Public School, Safira Lloyd. And she talked about how oftentimes in classrooms, do, do you see me? Have you even asked students? What do they want? What do they uh, need out of their instruction? What, what does it mean to take these conversations out of the classroom? We're not giving credit to the ability for students to elevate their own voices and we're operating in the fears of parents. I'll be honest, you know, many of our older adults, especially here in Oklahoma, we're looking at a vastly changing demographic. Um, in Tulsa, now under the age of 15, over 50% of our population is are children of color. That is a huge shift in comparison to our older population. And so it is, it's interesting how we're seeing change happen around us and more uh, legislation and rules put in place to stifle progressive movements for us to grow and evolve and have these conversations in our classroom and learn what really matters. Oh, thank you. And um, maybe, and maybe what feels riskiest is you get a group of students in a classroom and they empathize with each other. They see each other as human beings. They recognize that they've had different experiences. You know, they have a lot to offer each other if they can take a step back and, you know, stand in somebody else's shoes. So that, you know, that's what students really are hungry for. That's really, yeah, I, I, I hear you loud and clear on that one. That makes sense to me. I'd love to make sure we have uh, given understanding to the, the listener about how, and, and, and again, we get back into this vagueness issue somewhat, but um, how this applies to colleges and to K through 12 schools and, and disaggregate that a bit, just so people have a, 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 a better understanding of that. To which I hope you can do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I can speak to the rules as they pertain to K-12, um, the consequences that are related to the rules. It impacts any contractor that a school district uh, would work with. They could potentially lose state aid funding. Um, their district could be reported. And as they go through the accreditation process, losing accreditation or being placed on probation, teachers can be placed on probation or school uh, or their teaching certificates revoked. And the process in which these complaints go through is also not clearly defined. Um, as I mentioned earlier, parents, that a parent could be upset and or a student could file a complaint. It goes to the school. However, those complaints are supposed to roll up to the State Department of Education on a consistent basis as well to review those. As a board member, I have not seen any um, yet. However, this legislation and the rules were just introduced. So um, I will be interested to see what, what happens next. And these are emergency rules, meaning that they are only applicable for this school year. Uh, the permanent rules will be introduced with the rest of the rules. Again, in January, the process for comments and review will be taking place later in the fall, early winter. And so I do always encourage folks to say the fight is not over. The next round, when this goes before the board, 
We should be hearing from those who are just as invested in ensuring that our students have access to true history and, and hard truths within the classroom. And um, there are other voices needed in that fight. Uh, there was one, one out of 10, and it was a 16 year old African American girl. I know that there's more of us out there that want to see change for our students. And I'll turn it to you if that's all right. It's very different in the college and university world because there are no rules. There, there's no you know set of regulations to follow on this. But I think you know this you know wraps back around to what we said. So individual instructors, individual teaching assistants have to make their own decisions about what feels safe, what mm -hmm. feels like it you know follows a class plan. Um, that we've we've given um, instructions about you know how to teach documents. Don't hand them out to students anymore because mm -hmm. they might end up in the wrong hands. So you know put it up on the screen, and that's a terrible. I mean, you want students to learn how to read difficult documents, mm -hmm. not stare at a screen. So you know we we have made some decisions about that, but there aren't the sort of in your face regulations about how to actually teach this stuff right um and i noticed and I, one thing which was you know there's these rules that say well uh students can't be forced to go to trainings on you know uh um, um what was what was the term i'll actually look it up um mandatory gender or sexual diversity training or counseling but what constitutes that training you know are are, are certain it will curricula, you know, certain curricula, does that constitute to training on these issues? And we have seen um, university systems react with self-censorship, even seeing these, where it's like, okay, well, you know, we interpret tra training to refer to these types of teaching, so we will apply these particular provisions in a maximal way. And I think that gets to something that we've really teased out a lot here, which is that vagueness, right? Um, I don't know. I, well, we I don't did know. we did um, edge back from the new gateway course, which was all supposed to be about you know equity and and inclusion and getting students really talking about that at the beginning. So we're that instructors are still teaching that course, but there's another version of it now, so it's not required anymore. Wow. So that's a bummer. <laughs> that's that's good. So that's a bummer. Is yeah, understatement but a good takeaway. Um, to those watching in who feel, you know, uh, upset hearing about, um, about this law, about what's going on, uh, Carlisha, I think what you said is so, so, so important. And I, you know, you may want to repeat it, but the question is, I mean, what can I do? And so what are we saying uh, to all those who are asking that question? What can I do? How can I get engaged? How can I be involved? Yes, so I think, you know, Jim's comments when he opened this up and began talking about um, getting plugged in, running for school board, you know, there is a larger movement even behind the legislation of rushing towards elected office and filling those seats even on school boards to influence public education in deeper ways. And so I think that it's it's now is the time <laughs> to get engaged in that process and plug in. Additionally, as I mentioned, the permanent rules are up for adoption. There are several uh, education laws that are actually that have been passed that rules will be put in place for and getting connected to review public comment be a part of that process that is happening later this year and being voted on in January. So I, I just encourage us to, to not sit on the sidelines and wait until after the fact. As I mentioned, this was a well-organized effort. It happened swiftly. Individuals were reaching out to board members, reaching out to their representatives, be a part of the change and allow for even in our state for folks to know that we're standing united and we want to see change happen. You know, I think people need to look really carefully at some of those things that have become flashpoints and learn some more about them. So, you know, the 1619 thing that spun up last year got so much surprising, I guess not surprising, negative attention. Um, all of the stuff around CRT. So, you know, 
define it, find out, you know, what's actually in the 1619 presentation, you know, be able to defend, you know, why that's a really useful thing for students to see. Um, I think all of these things take a little time and a little explanation. Um, so I think, you know, getting, actually looking at some of these texts or bodies of information that are out there now and you know talk about it with your neighbors you know it's it's not that scary to look at these things well um in a few moments we're going to go to question and answer so if you have a question in mind please feel free to start putting it into the um question and answer sort of box uh and i will be able to see them on our end um, I guess the final question I'd love to ask while I still have all these privileges as moderator is just any, anything else that's been on your mind about this, any observations, any thoughts that keep occurring to you, anything that you feel is really important to highlight in this conversation that maybe we haven't hit yet? I can jump in. Um, so I, I have a lot of faith that we're going to you know, figure out a way to work through this. You know, I have faith in, you know, K-12 instructors, our hardworking TAs um, who are gonna carry all this risk. But I feel like my faith is actually a handicap because no one who's actually passing these laws has any faith in anything. This is, this is purely bad faith. This, this is an, a quick attack on this and it, really takes away the, the ability to have serious conversations about it. Um, so that's, that's frustrating. Yeah, yeah I, I would say, um, if we are waiting, I think there's a quote from President Obama that said, where he said, we are the ones we're waiting for, we are the change we seek. There is not someone who is going to come and save us and lead this charge. What is your role to take on? Uh, where will you be a part of this fight? It's not enough to sit on the sidelines. And honestly, if we look at 2020 and see how the pendulum just shifted, you know, we had um, in the summer of 2020 and the George Floyd murder and several conversations spark up about race and racism and systemic oppression and police brutality. It was really a place where I was like, wow, we are, we're having the conversations. And, and it was the time to be able to really break down those barriers and to connect to people as human beings and unpack lived experiences as people of color in this country to now we're sitting in this seat in 2021, which is shocking to say we're having a conversation about how we can't even talk about the hard truths and history of race and racism in the classroom. It just shows us how quickly things can change. Um, and, and this is not a time to sit down and feel like the work has been done. Because as I mentioned to you again, you know the permanent rules are coming. And when those rules are permanent, they are permanent. And so please be engaged, be a part of the process, understand what is going on and elevate your voice to advocate for our children. We need you. I have a question here from uh, the audience. I have only one question from the audience thus far, by the way, so keep them coming. Um, the question is, is, is there an organized movement to bring a lawsuit to overturn the law? And do either of you have a sense of, um, you know, the sort of legal state of play on any of this? I am not sure um, if there is an organized movement or lawsuit to overturn the law. I know that there had been discussion in regards to how the legislation even came to be. It was a part of another bill and all of this just passed through very, very quickly. But I don't have an answer to that question and um, actually would love to learn more about that if you know, Anne. Um, the, the quickest way is for an affected group. So a group of history departments or OU in general, or there could be various people can um, put together a petition to vacate the law. So at least it slows everything down. So I think that's, that's another place where people need to get moving and think about who the best partners would be. Because I think there's a, there's a K 
12 threat that has to do with those rules, it's very different than what's threatening at the university level. So I'm an attorney by background, so I will just add one quick thing. Uh, in fact, so I um, and Penn America, we're continuing to watch this space and we're actually planning to put out uh, a report on this shortly that will have some sort of policy analysis that may help answer some of these questions. But I will just say one thing to, to think about, which is, um, there's some comparison to these bills and a bill that existed in Arizona in 2010, House Bill 2281, it was called, and it, it made it illegal to teach ethnic studies courses in the state of Arizona. It was eventually invalidated on, con on constitutional grounds. However, that process took seven years. So first, there was more than one round of litigation. So one could have a, a more, a less conservative count uh, but the judicial process takes time, right? And for those listening who are concerned about this law, um, you know, the, the comment period that Carlisha has laid out is much sh shorter than, a, than potentially than a legal challenge could take, right? Um, that's just something to keep in mind um, when we're thinking about how we react to things. Um, and sort of where, where the right levers to, to push may be. Um, I still don't have any other questions from the audience, by the way, so please keep them coming, but it does mean I can keep asking questions, mwahaha. Um, I'd love to ask a question, you know, so PEN America is, is a free expression organization. We're, we're dedicated to sort of protecting freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Um, and I'd love to hear from both of you as to how this whole process, whether or how it's affected the way you think of freedom of expression, the way you think of freedom of speech, looking at, you know, looking at this law. Wanna go in? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Well, I think that, you know, honestly, and in, in thinking from the lens of a former educator myself, thinking about what can and cannot be shared or stated or even brought up from my own lived experience as a black woman in America in the classroom um, and limiting that expression. And so it, it's, it's definitely a threat. It's a threat to that. It's a threat to the free expression of ideas, whether in K-12, whether in higher education or even on, on the job as a professional. And, and so I'm very grateful for the work that PEN America is leading and the critical conversations around what's happening across our country in this regard. Well, it's, it's scary to watch things like, you know, what just happened in Texas last week with the and black superintendent, um, James Whitfield. And I think he essentially got fired for two Facebook posts that, you know, were very not controversial. Um, one person labeled him as, you know, teaching, you know, encouraging CRT in his district. And, you know, he had the same sort of response that Carlicia did, that he really never heard of it until, you know, pretty recently. So, you know, you, you can have your career ended and ruined in a heartbeat right now. Here's another question. Um, it's banned books week. How is book censorship part of this law, if it is? And, and I think we touched about that at points, but it's, I'd, I'd love to highlight it again. Um, uh, this applies to any curriculum or books that the students are able to read within the classroom that touch on these topics that make students feel uncomfortable. So it, it's, it's definitely uh, book censorship uh, as well as you know, speech and curriculum if there are topics within that um, content that make students feel uncomfortable due to their race, their gender, or their background. And of course, the point of those books is to make people uncomfortable and to see another perspective. So, uh, you know, that, that language is, you know, really difficult to manage because that, that's, that's the whole purpose of the humanities in action is to make people look at other human beings and see similarity. What about indigenous studies in Oklahoma? We have a, as a question. Uh, 
that seems less under the gun for whatever reason. Um, I, I mean, in, in, in a heartbeat that could disappear if, you know, somebody really wanted to apply this because, you know, the, the same history is underneath all that, that will, you know, make people feel guilty, feel bad um, if we talk about it in detail. Yeah, I agree. I think that it's been less of a larger topic of conversation, but the same I, I believe the same complexities apply. If you're really deep, diving deeply into indigenous studies and the history within Oklahoma, it is just as complex and filled with uh, racism as the experience of Black Americans in, in Oklahoma as well. So I, I could see both um, causing areas of discomfort. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, one thing I'd love to do right now before we end actually, is read the prohibited concepts really quickly because you know it's sort of like you get a sense almost immediately of how um, vague they are, um, how effectively they can be used as these broad ideological prohibitions. And so this is from the law itself. This is um, section one B one. Um, no teacher, administrator, or other employee of a school district, charter school, or virtual charter school shall require and make part of a course the following concepts. A, one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. B, an individual by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive, whether consciously or unconsciously. C, an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex. D, members of one race or sex cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race or sex. E, an individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. F, an individual by virtue of his or her race or sex bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. G, any individual should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of his or her race or sex or H, meritocracy or traits such as a hard work ethic are racist or sexist or were created by members of a particular race to oppress members of another race. And all of those things can be interpreted tremendously broadly to apply to wide swaths of any logical conversation that two reasonable people would have about issues for which race or sex plays a role. Any conversation of societal privilege appears to violate half of these principles. Um, let's see, we have a question. Um, what about the law to take up formal complaints from students of color who are made to feel uncomfortable? Do you think that would speed up the process of getting rid of the law? That actually did come up, I mean, in stating, I, I, there were many times as a black student in public school in Oklahoma that I felt uncomfortable, that I felt, you know, looked at in a certain way or stereotype because of my race, because of my gender. And so, and, and we know that students are experiencing things and we had cases in the news about students being at football game and called the n-word you know and uh, over an announcer from an announcer over the intercom right and so these experiences are happening for students and we look at this legislation and these rules and all we hear from our white parents saying that conversations about race don't belong in the classroom but black students within this district are being called racial slurs over an intercom by adults within a district, right? So I, I do think, you know, what does that look like for us to really hear the lived experiences of students of color um, and not target our larger districts who are doing a lot of the work on culturally uh, relevant teaching? They are the ones that are being targeted and looked at and said, hey, your social emotional learning curriculum, your culturally relevant teaching, it's in violation of House Bill 1775. And so uh, I think that that would be an interesting, interesting data point. I have a question here. Um, how much do you think this is a product of cancel culture? Hmm. 
I, I think, I think cancel culture is one of those phrases that is sort of a, a quick way to, you know, talk about all kinds of things. But I think this is actually it's the opposite of cancel culture, because what we want to do is bring everything back and look at it carefully. We don't want to cancel anything. We want to look at those documents. We want to look at, you know, those, you know, difficult stories, you know, people's experiences. We're not canceling anything. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it's easy to, um, in these moments, want to push things to the side. Uh, but when our students actually have the chance to trace back to the history, we can tie inferences to what we see playing out right now. It's very easy for the past to repeat itself when you ensure that the public and especially young generations know nothing of that past. And so this is um, systemic <laughs> and it actually is an example to me of critical race theory playing out within uh, America. I have a question here, Anne, do you know how this law has affected the College of Education at OU? Uh, if, if professors are concerned about engaging in these ideas in education class, how could this affect future generations of teachers? Well, I think, I mean, this is exactly what Carlicia was talking about. I mean, this is a generation of teachers who were learning culturally appropriate techniques. That's what they're learning how to do. Um, it's what they live and breathe at this point. So it, it's, it's gonna be a challenge for everybody coming out of that educational system, you know, all ready to go. Cause I think, you know, again, we were in 2020, we were gonna shift it up. Um, and now we're taking this big step back. Uh, yeah. Yeah, something that certainly, as I mentioned, we at PEN America have done a lot of um, reviewing of uh, a lot of these laws and it really is, it seems not coincidental that all of this is being proposed during a moment where institutions, American institutions, educational institutions, professional institutions are, are, are looking to kind of grapple with issues of race in, in, a, in a, you know, in, a, they in, in an intendedly productive way. And there's, you know, this new societal moment and um, these, these bills, uh, you know, seem to be a part of a backlash to that. Um, let's see, we've got five more minutes. I do want to end with this question, even though I, I feel we've answered it, but it's so important to hit this again, which is the, what can the average K to 12 parent do to help overturn this law? And I love to, you know, at, right before we close, really again, hit them with the, here's, here's, you know, what you can do. Here's what you should be looking for. Right. Um, I would say that the average parent, first of all, uh, write to your school, local school board members, state school board members, legislative representatives. I think that we're only hearing one side of the story. So definitely telling your story, uh, attending the state board meeting and being a part of the public comment process on the rules that are coming to be permanent rules here in January. And I think it's just really knowing that your voice matters. I get flooded with tons of emails and of my inbox, I'm rarely hearing from parents who want to overturn this law. Because the pitch really should be, your students are gonna be so disadvantaged if they go out in the world and they don't know how to talk about these things and they don't know that these things happened. Um, they, they will, they'll look ignorant. They'll, they won't have a skill set about how to have difficult conversations. So, you know, it's a disadvantage. You don't want your kid to be disadvantaged. Um, well, we, we only got four minutes left. So I would love to end, uh, with any final thoughts you may have, um, before we close out. This has really been a, a, a wonderful conversation. I really appreciate both of you joining us. Um, and, and sharing your insights and at points your personal experiences with what you know how you uh, interacted with uh, this bill as it became law and became implemented and the people you spoke with who shared their personal stories and their personal concerns and anxieties and hopes and fears. Um, and I hope that everyone who has attended today walks away with a better understanding of what this law is 
how it's part of a national trend and the steps they can take to um, register their concern, their opposition. Uh, and I hope they have walk away with a better sense for how these laws and these bills in places where they've been proposed but haven't become laws, um, the threat they face to academic inquiry, to freedom of speech of, of students and teachers, to, to freedom of expression and, and academic freedom, and to our rights and our abilities to learn about American history in a responsible way. Uh, so um, thank you to both of you so much for being here. Uh, thank you to our co-sponsors, the American Historical Society and Magic City Books. Um, thank you all those who attended, but I wanna really leave it to you two to have the last words on this. Well, I, I, um, I, I enjoyed preparing for this in, in a twisted way and you know, thinking about you know, how you begin to fight against this and understanding what it is people are scared of. You know, is it, is it, is it really um, the notion of talking about race that will undo everything that you know, parents have hoped and dreamed for in, for their children? Um, but kids are walking into a new world and they need the tools to be able to do this whether they're the college students or K-12 students, they you know, need to grapple with this past. Uh, I will close. Uh, Marissa actually was putting in a question and wrote something in the chat that stood out to me. And she said, I feel like the true lessons lie within the discomfort. And we're uh, robbing students and even as adults, the opportunities to sit with that discomfort and reflect upon our hard history. I think that where I would close out this discussion is just again, us all remembering our role, our part, and that our voice in this process matters. Um, especially those that are watching from states where legislation like this is being introduced. Don't just sit by idly and, and allow for it to happen. Elevate our voices, come together to plan a way to advocate for our students. Right now, they need our voices more than ever. Good note to end on. Thank you again both so much uh, for your time, for your insights, for your energy and engagement on this really important issue. And thank you to all the attendees for the, for the exact same. And I hope that this event leaves you energized to do more and um, to watch more and to, and to follow more, but also to do more and be vocal on these issues. Um, thank you all so much. And I hope you have a great rest of your evening.